I'm going to talk about, um, well, I started off talking about, I'm, I'm left-handed and we set the room up for right-handed people, so I'm over here. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff we've been doing to support and further uh, Nutix and more importantly why we, we want to do that and one of the things we've been working on which is the open source board because we view this as being a requirement in, in terms of the actions to create um, uh, ecosystems and to support ecosystems. So I'm going to talk about this very much from the perspective of our organization because already I've had several discussions, several people asking me what, what are you doing here? What's your involvement in this? Why are you wanting to do it? So I'm going to talk about why we need a, desire, a development setup, what's desirable about that development setup, and um, the actions we're taking, what we're trying to do in order to address that in terms of hardware, software, and most importantly, debug and system support, and examples of the tools we do use and we can use going forward. I'm going to move through this quite quickly. Um, there is a dem. I'm not going to do the dem because we are very behind schedule, but we will do the dems in one of the breakout <coughs> sessions at the end uh, to show you the kinds of things which are possible and the kinds of things which are already present and in these systems. So, and next steps, what we're going to do next. So, the problem we observe, and indeed every electronics oriented company observes, is that the lead times on product developments are too compressed to allow development from scratch. Everybody wants everything yesterday. They don't want to pay the full cost of development. They want it. I mean, you've already got one of these. Why can't you use that to start from and so on? And the hardware and the software are becoming too complex to allow a single development to take all the risk. So the risk of any product development is significant. Once your starting points, your building blocks, become more complex, the risk of you misunderstanding or misinterpreting something also increases and so the risks inherent in your product development increase. The way you can amortize that is by using the same product across several iterations of development, which we do. So we want to retain and reuse what we, what, what we know from one development to the next. So we start off with things which are, we, we have these things in the UK, I guess you have them in the rest of the world, uh, part-baked bread. And this is the example I use internally a lot. We want to have the ingredients mixed, we want the stuff half baked, we want it ready to go. So the only thing left to do is put it in the oven and finish it off. So when the customer comes to us and says, hey, I want one of these, we've already got 60, 70% of the design done. And that 60 or 70%, well, probably more like 50 or 60% of the risk taken out of that development. The reason people come to our organization to Technolution is because when it comes to Technolution, it works. We're not the cheapest. Our customers all point out to us quite vigorously, we're not the cheapest. But they don't come to us because of the cheapest. They come to us because we tell them the date that they'll get it, and that it will work, and what the spec will be, and they know that it will be. If we screw that up one time, then I've got a lot more difficulty justifying that, that bill. So our organization, uh, is based on making sure that what we do is reliable as it goes out the door because that is the only basis on which we um, can thrive as a commercial organization. We've been doing this for 30 years, so we know that we know as a technique it works. So in terms of what we try to do and what we have been trying to do and what we, the reason we're involved in Nutex, on the hardware we want to find a good range of, of devices which share as much commonality as possible. So that when we do have to move from one to device to another, again, we're minimizing risk. It's all about risk. We don't tend to lose the spacecraft. On some occasions we do. We don't do much in the way of space work, but we can lose the vehicle. We can lose the bridge. We can lose the control system. We can lose the customer, which is what's important to us in terms of what we do. So it's just as important, even if it's perhaps no, not so dramatic, when we lose the device. <clears throat> software, fi wide families of software, flexible, well-developed structures that we can take piece parts and build them up into, into, um, into practical products. And similarly with the tooling. If we have to learn new tooling for everything we build, it does not work, it does not scale. Because we will misunderstand the tooling, we will misuse <coughs> the tooling. We have to learn about the tooling. 
All of that comes with all about removing the risk. So in terms of the hardware, well, we took a look around at the market and we did this thing, uh, which some of you know about, it's called the VerisiBoard. This is now Rev3, which is close to production. Um, this pretty much could go to production now. Uh, and this we will make open source. Why open source? Well, because we increase the number of eyes that are looking at it, we remove more risk. There's a theme here. So we, if we can get other people to use this thing, to find its limitations, to find its problems, then we harden what we've done. And from our point of view, it doesn't carry any commercial risk. It actually removes commercial risk because our customers don't come to us because we can build something. They come to us because we can build something reliably. So in terms of improving the reliability of it, anything we can do to improve the reliability is actually a benefit to us. If someone comes to us wanting bottom dollar, it doesn't really fit what we do. We're about the quality thing. So, in terms of what this is and what it's got, it's sort of a do-everything board from which point you can start. It lives at the bottom part of the market uh, in terms of, of price per unit. And it's a do-everything board from which we can cross off blocks, say, right, we don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this. So we end up with a product which is smaller than um, the, the prototype. So it has automotive range input. It has 10 base, 10 100 base T Ethernet, battery back RTC, and um, uh, there is a domain, a battery back domain with some battery back RAM on these particular parts. Full speed and high speed OTG USB 2. External power supplies as well. You are I2, I squared C, analog inputs, RS485, CAN, a chunk of flash, 8 megs on the current ones. Uh, a nice chunky processor, the pro fastest processor family on the market in the M series at the moment. SDHC, soft power, it can turn itself on and off, uh, going to low power modes and so on, various indicators. Wi Fi and Bluetooth, which is a bane of my life at the moment, and the Raspberry Pi header, and most importantly, full Cortex debug and trace. I'm going to come back and talk about that in some detail in a few moments. So the intention behind this um, is that it's a sort of do everything, but you notice there's no external RAM. For the kinds of deployments we want to use this for, we don't generally need external RAM. So the complexity of doing that, of adding that in is not needed. I'd rather have the pins for the Raspberry Pi header. So typically, <clears throat> if we're using this for a control application, I would use RS485, maybe CAN, and maybe I want EtherCAT. Because this is a Raspberry Pi header, I just get an EtherCAT Raspberry Pi board, plug it on top, I've got EtherCAT. So I've got a general board that I can use for the early stage prototyping of all of our developments. Why do we choose IMXIT, RT even? Uh, again, it's because of risk reduction. There's a whole family of these, I just grabbed this from their website. There's a whole family here of devices which, as David will tell you, are not quite as similar as we would like them to be, but they are pretty much the same devices all the way through the range. So when I decide that I need to go up the range or down the range, within limits, they've managed to label a couple of IMXRT devices which are different, very, very different, but within limits, you can work with a device and still progress through the range. And we chose one reasonably close to the bottom because it's a four euro, five euro part in small volume, which for our kinds of markets is, is perfectly, perfectly acceptable. When we look at it from the software side, well, that one's pretty easy, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So all the things you're hearing about um, Nutux and the reasons why people are using Nutux and, and, and strapping it into large rockets and uh, various other applications in mines and all sorts of places you'll hear over the next couple of days. Um, they're good reasons. They're reasons that we're interested. Um, I want to be able to use MQTT on a particular application. I might want to use IPv6. Immediately I can get those things directly out of the toolbox and other people have tested them and they have value to me because they're tested. And chances are they've tested them in strange and weird environments that I haven't even thought of and bugs are being shaken out. And that is the utility for me. So that's why we are here. Uh, the actual, for we discussed this last night, 
as far as I'm concerned, putting on events like this, helping to build the community, trying to contribute to the community, is the tax I pay for getting access to all this brain power and to all these capabilities. I know a lot of companies like to take and don't necessarily give back. That's not the way we work, um, never has been. Um, we want to contribute. We feel we have to pay our taxes in order to be a member of this community. And we genuinely believe that. Uh, we're a bit of an unusual company, but we do genuinely believe that. But what I really want to talk about today is tooling. Because I think tooling is something which we have under-addressed, and it's something that's pretty close to my heart, because I'm generally speaking about timescales when we're building things. So I want to talk about this in a little bit more detail, almost as a launch presentation, really, for some of the stuff that I'm going to be looking at shortly. So in general, unless we have particular reasons, we do have particular reasons on, some, on many occasions, we're looking at generally we start at GCC and GDP. We are increasingly using Rust, and Owen just popped his head around the corner at the back of the room. If you want to talk about Rust, he's the guy to talk to. We are increasingly using Rust for a lot of our developments, but we tend to use Rust on the desktop where it is mature and stable. We have done some experimental work with Rust for Embedded. We've done a few events here in a similar fashion to this with the Rust community for <coughs> Rust for Embedded. And we will uh, expand our presence there because as far as we can feel, it's going in the right direction. But it's a long way away from production ready yet. I think even Erwin, who's a Rust zealot inside the organization, would be the first one to admit that. But if we use GCC and GDP, sorry, go Just out of interest, sorry to interrupt, but yes. how long is a piece of string? But when you say a long way away, a year, five years? Erwin, how long? <laughs> well, that depends on who you talk to mostly. <laughs> <laughs> I think three or four years before you've got. Uh, to, be, to be fair, the, one, the biggest thing that's missing is a capable operating system that's well, well, well field tested. And vendor awareness. And vendor awareness, yeah. But until, until we see other people using it, because no matter how much we test it internally, we're not going to knock all the edges off ourselves. So until we see people using it and we're not the first ones to lead it, we, we, we won't go there for commercial product. We might do a product to try it, but we wouldn't use it for mainstream commercial product until we're comfortable that the community exists. Desktop's slightly different. Desktop is getting very good uh, traction, and for good reasons, and we'll talk about that over the lunch break. So I want to be able to use all these other tools that we got from the desktop. All this other stuff, profiling, code coverage, even top. All of this stuff from the desktop, I want to know what my code is really doing, not what I think it was doing, and which it manages to do, in spite of the quality of my coding. So I want to be able to use all these tools to validate and to feel more and more comfortable that what's going off inside this little lump of plastic with legs on it is really what I think is going on. So I want to validate its correct operation. So as far as we're concerned, visualization and instrumentation is every bit as important as the compiler and the OS in which it runs. And it's the bit that I think we have under-addressed at this point in time. And it's under-addressed all the way through the embedded community. It's not just under-addressed here. I don't, I don't think it is particularly under-addressed here. I think, I think um, it, it's certainly no worse than the rest of the community, but I would like it to be a shining light rather than the same as everybody else. And indeed, uh, Greg already mentioned it, some of the stuff we did when I looked at the um, real-time response latency and we got responses that were anything up to 10 microseconds for, for an interrupt and handling the interrupt. And you just look at that and go, that's not, that's not right. But because for most applications it was good enough, and because no one else had dug right into it and looked at it, it was good enough. And there are certain other operating systems which are in various stages of, of, um, of growth at the moment where this performance and this behavioral stuff is simply not being looked at at all. And for me, it's absolutely key. Because if I'm sat in spin loops, if I'm not responding in time, I'm, I'm burning battery, I'm burning resources, I'm done. all sorts of things are happening under the hood which have consequences for me in the field. And that's a problem. Or in the air, or in space, wherever I happen to be operating, whatever it is, it's a problem. So, I want to talk about that. So, 
the simple one, uh, some of this, anybody's, uh, well, I'll give you some references in a while. The simple one that we all know about is just a flashing LED. So you, um, you basically just put a LED on a pin. When you go, uh, when you go busy, you set, set the busy flag. When you go idle, you set the idle flag. The proportion of the time for which it's busy, or um, the, the higher the, 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 the higher <coughs> time on the LED. You stick to the appropriately sized capacitor and resistor on that pin. Uh, this is actually sized for 3.3 volts, and you'll get out a percentage directly on your multimeter. So that system was running 88% loaded at the point where I took that photograph, because it's loaded for one volt. We've done this forever. Unfortunately, <laughs> in a lot of cases, this is where people stop. Oh yeah, I've got an LED. An LED-based debugging 20, 30 years ago, was state of the art. I, I, had, I had three LEDs, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but this, we've never really, well, we have gone a little bit beyond that, to be fair. We got, we got, oh, sorry, yeah, I've got to talk about this. So, uh, this is my contribution to the world of the flashing LED. So, if you, we've all got these really nice scopes now with all those maths functions on them that no one uses because they don't really know what the mass functions are for or they've not, gotten, they've not spent the time to get their head around it. But if you put, if you put a low pass filter on, on that pin, on your scope, then immediately, so this is the pin going up and down, and as you can see, it's really, really busy. But this is a low pass version of that pin. And this is actually a direct in time reading of how busy that, um, that processor actually is. So this is uh, this has not got resistors on it because I couldn't be bothered in this case. So this is proportion of 3.3 volts, so it's about 18 or 20 percent loaded. But this is actually generating video. This particular example. So this is the frame refresh. This is when it's a little bit busier, and I'll show you why in a second. This is what it's doing. There's another <coughs> frame refresh. So immediately I can see in time how busy my processor is and how that busy factor is changing over time. And already, I'm into revolution for a lot of our guys. I can tell that. So we did this. Uh, I did this over Christmas for Alan, actually, wherever he is. Yeah. So uh, as, a, as an example that we could bolt into into Nutix. And this was just this is an um, uh, STM32 F103 uh, producing um, video directly, directly producing video. I think. YouTube being a wonderful thing, because I dropped it up on YouTube. If I click here, absolutely nothing. Ha oh, no, I've got to click on this one. Sorry. Oh, that's nice. Oh, I've got loads of YouTube. OK. Um, probably not on the net. Oh, I won't be on the network, because I switched the network off, so I didn't get disturbed. OK, that's not going to work. So I'll show you afterwards. Um, but anyway, that, that's fine. Then we move on. Serial port I.O. This is also the one everybody knows. The first thing you do is bring up a serial port. Uh, output is easy. You, uh, you generally run up to about 110k bytes. So uh, a megabit or so is about the most you get out of this. Uh, and everybody knows how to do it. I'm sorry. I apologize to um, the um, Nutix purists in here. This, these things happen to be based on census. But it doesn't matter that the principles hold across the two. Um, but doing it without interrupt support or without DMA support obviously uses some of your CPU. Semi hosting. This works in the situation where you've already established a link between your uh, debug and your device. And in the context of that link, you can transfer additional information. And because the guys at ARM are quite smart, um, they use standard file semantics for doing it. <laughs> it is relatively slow. The bits and on the this this is again how long's a piece of string. This will vary according to your compiler, according to your debug host, according to your target device, according to what backends. So this is only a rule of thumb. But it's relatively slow. It's really good for. Um, <coughs> generating test cases, data in and out, things of that nature. You only need to add a line into your configuration. You need to remember to do a little bit of initialization before you start. 
and then generally you've got print capabilities. Not quite so straightforward in Nutex because we have our own libraries. So just be aware, but this can still be done. There's no big deal in doing it. It's actually a little bit easier in Nutex, it's just different. So if you want to do it and you don't know how, drop me a note. Um, <clears throat> and if you're using something like a J-Link, then they actually export a, a port on which you can get to this information. But it wrecks the real-time semantics because at the point where that exchange of information is being done, it breaks into debug mode. It does not stay running. And depending on what CPU you're using, the clocks stop, the world freezes, all sorts of strange things happen. So you can't use this in a real-time system, which makes it a limited utility when you're debugging an RTOS. And then what I wanted to talk about, single wire app or SWO, this is the starting point for this. Comes for free with most pros, provides lots of functionality. There are, there's a whole infrastructure behind this. I'm starting off with SWO as an example, but there are 32, it's actually 256, but there are 32 easily accessible debug channel, channels. We also have hardware tracing and sampling, so we can start to look at what the process is actually doing. We can do debugged watches and traps, we can put timestamps on things and things of that nature. And it gives us in the order of, again, depending on your particular implementation, your environment, about a tenth of a megabyte of data per second. The beauty of this is the only thing you need to use it is uh, one of the little cheapo $2 UART adapters. Everybody will try and sell you a much more expensive adapter. You don't need any of it. Uh, and it needs, and because the data comes all across the link in a packetized format, uh, it comes from something called the ITM, the Instruction Trace Macro Cell. It has to be depacketized in order to make full use of all of these channels and so on. Virtually no one has done that work, and this is where the problems start. No one, apart from the expensive, very, very high quality uh, pro producers like Lauterbach and people like that, have, have done the work to make this stuff openly and easily available. <clears throat> this is the structure of how the thing holds together. Uh, the important thing, this is called the embedded trace macro cell. Uh, this allows you to do real-time tracing of what's going off. It goes through an interface into the format to serialize it and spits out over the trace that has to be open. The instruction trace macro cell, this guy, and then behind it, a thing called the DWT, uh, which I haven't even got on this drawing, but the DWT gives you all this information about this is the instruction I'm executing. And then I've also got the ability to put in serial debug channels. So 32 independent channels of serial output. So all the uh, debugs and traces and warms and everything that we do at the moment per, per particular subsystem, we can actually have coming out separately and distinctly into separate trace windows on the target machine with no performance overhead to all intents and purposes, very, very low performance overhead. So I said that no one had done this stuff. We actually have done this stuff. We've got this tool that's called a Buckleum. For those of you who don't know, a Buckleum is a posh name for a, um, uh, 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 fortune teller's ball, crystal ball, um, <clears throat> which allows you to take this SWO feed as it comes in. As I said, it's just a serial, <coughs> it's no big deal, into a Buckleum, and then a Buckleum will feed it out into various other applications. So directly as multi-channel text and variable output, so you can construct what form you want your output to look in. I want to merge this channel and this channel and print it as text. I want to merge this, I want to have this channel print it as a hex value, whatever it happens to be. Orb top, which is a top utility, so you can actually see what's going on. And orb stat, which gives statistics about your runtime behavior of your code. This stuff is all done. Uh, Obuculum is available, it's open source. Uh, you can go to Obuculum and you can download it. I have to confess, uh, commits haven't been made for about a year. It doesn't mean it's dead, it just means it's dead stable. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh. Okay, but um, this is the channel, so you run just, uh, this is mostly notes for you guys if you want them for later. So you run a book along, you tell it what uh, channel zero, I'm going to call <coughs> debug, I just want it to print characters. Channel one, I'm going to call client events, I'm going to print characters. Channel two is actions, I'm going to print characters. Channel three is, I'm going to call Z, I'm going to print numbers. Channel four is temperature, I'm going to print temp equals blah, blah, blah. 
and then it appears simply as uh, a set of FIFOs in a directory. I told it to put it in a directory called uh, SWO. So, and then I can just cat those. So I can just open Windows and cat those files, and anything that happens over those links will come out distinctly. And I can merge these things together so that I can have multiple channels coming out uh, intermingled into code. Um, and then I can do clever things like I can just send strings, I can send ints, I can send more strings. Uh, and then, when it starts to get really interesting, there was one, sneakily, at the bottom, there was one extra thing in here called hardware event. And hardware event, I didn't really talk about, but this allows us to say, it will tell me what's going off in the CPU in real time. So I tell it here, I want the DWT module to, do, to trace exceptions. One, just let me switch it on. And then in the HW, HW event file, I get told with time ticks in microseconds against the previous time this event occurred, I get told what happened. There was a thread resumed, there was a cystic, the cystic finished, the thread resumed, there was a cystic, the cystic finished. And you notice these are at one microsecond intervals, one millisecond intervals, sorry. So 1,000 microseconds. And that all comes out for free in real time. Most importantly, no instrumentation of your code at all. There is nothing you need to do to your code in order to use this. It's there already. It just isn't switched on. On particular CPUs, you may have to reconfigure a thing <coughs> in order to make it available as output, but you can do that from the debugger side. You don't have to do it from the uh, client side. So going a little bit more, I'm going to show this live on a IMXRT uh, on, on the VersiBoard actually, running um, Nutix. Uh, but I'm not going to do it now because demos in a demo field never work well. So um, we'll we'll do it after the event. But this is just uh, a simple top. This is uh, I told it to. I started all plot, which is just thing that generates a graph, and I told it to do a top. I told it to use. It needs an elf file in order to get the symbols. Uh, but once it's got the elf file and you've got the debug symbols in the elf file, that is it. It doesn't need anything else. And then it will just grab these data, their stream to it in real time, and it will tell you exactly what is going off in your application. I mean, 110 kilobits, kilobytes is not sufficient to have a full instruction trace coming out of the... This is not a full instruction trace. This is a sample. So it's just dipping in, grabbing something, dipping in, grabbing something. You can configure how often it samples, and you can configure the speed of that interface. Okay. So the maximum speed of that, I only give that 110 kilobytes as an example of the kinds of speed. The, if you're using something like a Blackmagic Pro, you'll get about two and a half megabits of stream data. If you're using an FTDI probe, you'll get 12 megabits of data. So you've got 12 megabits available in the channel. How you choose to use that and how you choose to fill it up is up to you. So, you can fill it up with sample data, you can fill it up with debug messages, whatever you choose. If it overfills, it will say, I've overfilled. So you will know about it. And then, well, once you've got these data, you can obviously do, you know, from embed an embedded system, I showed this to our guys when we first started doing this stuff, and I showed them this graph, and they just went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, it's, but it's not rocket science, this stuff exists. Sorry, this question. So, uh, does this mean that you do some instrumentation in Nutix for, for getting the information out as well? No. Nope. How do you know if when you're resuming a thread? Uh, there's an exception generated on the ARM processor, or there's a report generated on the ARM processor. There's a whole family of interfaces in, in the operating system you probably should look at. They all start with the name SCAD node, and it'll tell you whenever, whenever interrupts are disabled, whenever right. any of those things. So there are, there are multiple layers to this. Is the the very ba base layer of ac exceptions in the uh, processor? So this is when um, uh, when an interrupt occurs, when a return occurs, when it starts sleeping, when it stops sleeping, and so on. They're the really base layer. Those are reported automatically through the SWO. Yep. So those things are below the operating system. Yeah, that, that's but the system. there's another layer on top of that, which is even more juicy which is what the operating system is doing and how the operating system is behaving. This is the bit we're going to talk about next. <laughs> so, 
Uh, you don't need to see this. But um, basically, if you bolt these two routines into your code, again, it's just documentation for later, uh, we can start to be able to see which routines are calling each other live, either in real time, if your machine's quick enough, or you can just take a sample and analyze it later. So this is just doing orbstat. I told it I want to put the output in a dotty format. And it says, OK, well, your interrupts, you've got 2,579 of these interrupts, which led me to go to the, well, this is the USB thing. So I went to the USB handler. Or the other 29 interrupts went to the timer handler. And the timer handler cleared the pending bit. And it did um, get interrupt status. Obviously, that, that's some kind of polling loop because that, went, that happened 31 times. But the time clear pending bit is exactly the same number of times as the interrupt occurred. So that occurs every single time. And so all of a sudden, I've got a different representation of what my code is doing. And particularly when you're reverse engineering code or trying to understand someone else's code, which is equivalent to reverse engineering quite often, um, then you've suddenly got all these alternate views of what's going on in the system. And then because the internet is a wonderful thing, other people did a much better job with Dotty than I did. And there are um, other utilities out there which give you the same information, but with the hot paths shown. So this, the orange path is your hot path. This is what's taking up most of your time. And again, it comes out automatically. No instrumentation needed. Um, this is just a sequence of instructions to do it. So here, I can see that I'm actually getting kicked off. I've got events, four or five different things which are causing events. And then these are my responses. And I've probably, you can't see it on here, but I've told it anything that's less than 0.01% of the processor utilization. Don't bother telling me. I'm not interested. But this stuff all comes for free. It's all already there. And then we go on to the more clever stuff, which is when we do come up to the operating system, or we have the option to come up to the operating system layer, which is there's a very nice utility inside of Linux called kcashgrind. And kcashgrind allows you to look around cashgrind output files and be able to see what routine called what routine, under what conditions, how many times, how long did it spend in there, and so on. The very nice thing about kcashgrind is the format of the file it uses is open. So what we did, we took orbstat and we implemented uh, a kcashgrind <coughs> interface for it. So orbstat will now run into directly into kcashgrind. So you can do, you can capture a file, and then you can say, my CPU is spending, something spending a heck of a lot of time busy. What was going on? And I get here all the analysis of what's really going in the application. I hook it to the source code, so I can click into the source code. And then I get graphical presentations of where all that time is being spent. And I can dive into things, go up and down to look and, and look at what's been going on. All of that stuff we have. It isn't all bolted into um, Nutix right now, but it's all available in the Obuklum repositories. So you can use it just now. Now, all of that is using SWO. So to your point, SWO has a certain maximum speed. It doesn't, it, it's variable whether that maximum speed is 100 kilobits or whether it's a megabit or whether it's 10 megabits, but it is a fixed speed. And you will overfill the channel because there's just one bit. Alongside the SWO output here, those same data can also be output over parallel trace pins. On the, course, on the case of a Cortex-M, where MN, where N is 3 or above, there's up to 4 trace pins. M0 doesn't have this. M3 and above do have this. And I apologize to everybody that's not working with ARM family. I have no idea what facilities you've got on your family, but I have to start somewhere. <clears throat> the data from the ETM, the embedded trace macro cell, does spit out every single instruction which is executed. Not cleanly, it compresses it, because otherwise that's a heck of a lot of data. But you need about 1.1 bits per herps of, uh, as a rule of thumb, of, of what you're actually recruiting, the bandwidth you need in order to fully report on what the process, that's arms own number. So if I've got a 500 megahertz ITM uh, uh, IMXRT, I need a fairly significant amount of bandwidth. And actually, the only way you can get access to this realistically is using dedicated logic, FPGA. 
We have in the Abuklan repositories, there's an FPGA implementation of this for the ICE-40. So you can do this on an ICE-40 right now. But it tops off at around about an execution speed of your host of around about 100 megahertz. So if your chip is running faster than 100 megahertz, you just can't capture fast enough. But if you're below 100 megs for your target processor, yeah, it'll work perfectly well. But the next thing is, is basically to take this, all the data which comes out of SWO can also come out of trace data. So we expand, instead of this saying SWO feed, it now says trace feed, and we gain a new bit, which is all trace. And this gives us complete instrumentation free, we don't have to do anything to our code, <coughs> instrumentation free, real time, trade code, cool. put my teeth back in, trace and coverage. This is the thing I want. I want to know what my CPU is really doing at the instruction level, not what I think it should be doing based on the specification I wrote and based on the code I've created. So I'm going to have a bet later with Greg about which of his routines he thinks is most run during the operation of the system, because it surprised me when I found out which one it was. It's not, it's not idle. It's not idle. It's a, be, be, besides idle. <laughs> you, got, you got worried there for a second. No, besides, besides I, I was going to show it here, but I really want to move on. So uh, we'll we'll do that later in one of the breakouts. But it surprised me, and because, and if you actually look at it, let's put your mind at rest. Generally speaking, uh, the processor is 98, 99 percent idle. So there's, there's no problem there. But of the rest of the time, where is it being spent? And it is a little bit of a surprise where that is quite often in your systems of work, where that time is being spent. And that's what I need to know. That's what our guys need to know in order to be able to use these systems. Um, I cheated a little bit. I've got a J trace here. So um, uh, Sega have been doing some of this kind of thing. I find that uh, they have a, use, a, a debugger called Ozone. I have a lot of difficulty getting Ozone to be stable on my platform. It may be incompetence on my part as my wife frequently tells me, or it may be, um, it may be some, some issues with the platform, I don't know, but, uh, but certainly I have some difficulty keeping it stable. It's ozone. <laughs> Sorry? Who said that? It's not your platform. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to comment. I'm on video. Right. <laughs> so, uh, this gives you an example of the kind of thing we can produce. We can produce this from the Obokalum tools as well. Uh, and the number of fetches that it presented and the available load uh, this, is a, this is my system actually booting, uh, going through the boot process uh, and what was actually going on um, and all the various bits and pieces. And alongside that, here, this is a power trace. You can't really see the green. The green is the average of the power trace. So this is my system coming up, initializing. Uh, in this case, the jump is when I switch on the SD card. So the SD card takes a significant amount of current. And then the peaks in here are when I'm performing reads and writes to that card. So with all of this instrumentation, I can start to see what's really going on in my system. And then I can feel a lot more comfortable when I give it to the customer. And that's, for me, what this is all about. Uh, and then we also get, oh, who hasn't been trapped in the hard fault handler and thought, how the heck did I get there? <laughs> One of the nice things you get is because you get historic trace, you get information about how did you get there? Which is my idea of heaven, being able to figure out how I got into the hard fault handler. So here's a hard, here's a hard fault trace I create, uh, fault I created earlier. I'm quite good at them. Um, uh, and this was actually switching on. Uh, it was clearing the cache as it was switching on. Actually, I, I, I made a screw up. So basically, here, this is me going into the hard. I hit the assert. I actually hit an assert, not a hard fault. Uh, I hit an assert because there was a problem, and then I can go back here. These are all the source code lines which executed under the individual instructions that executed leading up to me ending up in there. That's three days saved for most people. Dave, how, how deep of a trace do you typically have to go back to find this? Because I found it like overwhelming, the amount of information. There is an enormous amount of data that comes out of this poll. And I do not believe that anyone can make use of all of those data, apart from code coverage. We can, we can also do code coverage. So see which lines were executing how many times and so on. Um, particularly for things like hard faults, generally speaking, they're within 
25 lines of, of when you hit the, the hard fault. We do occasionally, as Greg knows perfectly well, we occasionally get something where we've, we've whacked an operating system structure and then at some seemingly irrelevant point in the future, the whole thing falls over. They're not the general case. The general case is within 10 or 20 lines of where you, where you actually are. Do you think there would be a possibility for a tool that would help filter this to find the irregular pattern? It would be nice to have decent tooling that at least gets us this base data first, and then I'm sure there are a lot of very, very smart things we can do with it afterwards. Yeah. Well, because I, I had a bug that was, you know, very, very long trace history um, with nesting of interrupts that were turned on by accident, right? And so I was crashing, you know, 40,000 lines yeah. before this. And if there was a way to grab that and filter it, it would be so helpful. I'm 100% sure it can be done. Um, I, I don't, for the most part, unless you're prepared to, to spend a couple of thousand dollars getting a JTrace and then learning its foibles to actually start to use it, um, we don't have that tooling. I'm interested in the, the manufacturers that are in the room. I'm interested about how they perceive the tracing capabilities because these are facilities which are on the part from ARM but they do not seem to be widely deployed and widely used. And they are much, much more important than having particular libraries or particular flashy demos or, or whatever it happens to be. And yet on most of the dev boards, in fact, almost without exception, on dev boards, you do not get the trace brought out. So just as a side note, K66 brings the trace out on the SDIO card. So you can use an adapter and you can pick up the... the now that's cool. That's it's really beautiful. Smart. It's, yeah. it's really smart. Whereas IMXRT, they sort of took all the pins and went, put them yeah. on the board somewhere as far as I can tell. <laughs> but, <laughs> there's, there's just differences in different chips. Okay, so the future. Full profiling of code runs. So I want to be able to have this thing running as part of my regular test strategy. The amount of data it creates as a result of doing that is penal. Is absolutely horrible, but it means I get full test code. I get full code coverage information. Historically, I can look at this with GCOV or whatever and say, "Hey, this is how much code I still got left to test. I didn't code, I didn't check these paths." So I want to be able to do that on an embedded system the same way that we do that on a desktop system today. <clears throat> Non-intrusive, full speed code path observation. There's no requirement for instrumentation. Once you've got an operating system, there are additional things we can do. We can start to talk about maximum stack deaths. We can talk about uh, priorities of calls, interrupt handlers, all sorts of bits and pieces. But you would generally send those over one of those 32 channels. So there's a sort of expectation that the first eight or 10 of those channels will be used for operating system purposes. So we can easily instrument Nutix to include this stuff at a very low level in the, in the, in the scheduler and in the support routines for the scheduler. So, for example, having it in the malloc and free routines, we can get full profiling of what, alloc what allocated memory, when did it allocate it, how much did it allocate, did it overwrite, all that sort of stuff we can get with the appropriate tooling behind it. It's full speed software channel output. There's no, particularly if you're using Trace, there is no limitation, really, because you're limited by the speed of the CPU. So effectively, there's no limitation to the amount of data you can throw off your processor. Uh, I haven't even talked about triggers. We have the ability to be able to say, starting at this point, record a trace, stop at this point. So there's information on this at shaytail.com and at Obukulum. Uh, actually, that should be Orb Trace Obukulum, but Mubs Obukulum will get you there. So um, please take a look, provide feedback. My next project after I finish VersiBoard is to get the FPGA variant of this up and running on a slightly faster FPGA. Uh, which actually arrived last week, so I can make a start on that. So and then 100 uh, megahertz uh, was just for the current version of the FPGA? The 100, the 100 megahertz maximum CPU speed is for this current version of the FPGA, but to say it isn't user friendly would be an understatement. It is possible to get it working. The very best of luck. <laughs> um, I would recommend you wait until the end of the autumn, by which time I'll try and productionize something so that normal human beings have got, have got access to this stuff. For now, I would view it as a proof of concept. 
you will pay, I dread to think how much we'll have to back charge you for this. The J Trace is a couple of thousand dollars. If you are doing this for production use inside of your company, I recommend, particularly the Sega stuff, I recommend heartily that you go get Sega probes because they do just work. Um, I wish I could say the same about Ozone at the moment, but it is improving. So over time, I would suggest that the Sega stuff is a better route forward. But for just having something on a 50 or 100 euro probe that I can just drop onto a board and leave there on a semi-permanent basis for all of our guys, that's, that's where I, I want to be. Okay, that's all I really wanted to say. It still took me longer than I expected. We have one more presentation to do before lunch. So, um, any questions? Um, in your software development process, do you use tools like this to regularly characterize how your software is behaving, or did, does this come up mostly when you're trying to diagnose what's going on in a problem? I want it to become much more mainstream for our embedded stuff. We tend to use it on the embedded side as an exception process. Um, we do have other tooling in our embedded uh, side to, to make sure that the, so the software is behaving as we expect it to, and we obviously generate a lot of logs and outputs and things. Um, on the desktop side, it's much more normal to instrument and to do code coverage and things like this. But I want it to become ubiquitous across everything, everything that we do. And I think that would be absolute best practice. I don't know of people that are doing this as a regular line of business. I think we're probably at the leading edge for wanting to do this just now. Even, even guys I know in automotive doing critical code do not generally uh, fully characterize this stuff, in my experience. I think they probably do. Um, they're just not the kind of people I get to interact with. Okay, one more, last one. Uh, any security concerns? Because you have access to everything at all time. Yeah, it's my code, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but once the stuff goes to field, uh, there are, uh, every CPU has the ability to burn security bits so all this stuff can be turned off. So when, once you're caught, uh, and actually the more modern processors um, have some rather clever, um, effectively passwording, where you can leave the facility turned on, but locked down and protected, so that a device from the field, you can still recover from the field and do this kind of testing if you know what its setup passwords are. Mm -hmm. I would be very uncomfortable with that because it means there's one golden password that gets you into the whole of the system. Mm -hmm. um, but those things are possible. So all things are possible from completely wiping this out when it reaches the field back to um, having it completely available when it's in the field. Okay, go on then, very, very last one. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I think all these trace macros on the uh, Cortex-M processor are optional, so you might control them to configure into the Cortex core or not. So is it is it typical that they are present on the On, on the M3 and above, it's typical that they're present. Okay. Um, you, there are a whole set of configuration bits about what's been implemented, what hasn't been implemented, and so on. In general, the stuff is there. Okay. But I couldn't, I, I'm not a wide enough expert on all of this to know that it definitely is there on every single CPU. But the time when it becomes a problem is um, when you're pin short and the pins end up getting reused for other purposes. And that, that is much more of an issue. It's certainly an issue on IMXRT. The, on the 144 LQFP variant, which is the one we use in VersiBoard, um, the pins are shared with the Ethernet connector. So you can't do this while you're using Ethernet, which is a major constraint, as far as I'm concerned. So, okay, that was it. So, we're finished.